Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the problem of construction waste. And when I say construction waste, we're talking specifically about construction materials. I'm thinking new materials that went unused and old materials that went to waste. We see them piled up on job sites or in dumpsters, and it really begs the question, could it be done differently? Is there a better way for contractors, or for that matter, the industry, to handle waste better? And that's what we'll be getting at over the next 45 minutes or so today. But before we begin, our panelists, though they need no introduction, they certainly deserve one. For joining us today is Wayne Turret, founder and head of the Turret Collaborative, an architecture and interiors firm in New York that's built a sterling reputation on the mission Build better spaces for our city's residents, preserve our planet, and create beautiful designs. Wayne's work has earned the firm accolades throughout the industry and has also been featured in countless publications, including this one. Tracy Stevens has led her new work based kitchen and bath design firm, Tracy Stevens Interior Design, for more than 30 years. Her work has always emphasized sustainable practices, design, and materials. She's a graduate of the Parsons School of Design, an NKBA sustainability specialist, re green trained professional, and the list goes on. And finally, we are joined by custom builder, Stephen Paul Rand, who as the head of Homefront Built in Los Angeles has garnered a lot of attention for his dedication to historic preservation and sustainability in his projects. He's also the founder of Carbon Shack, a design firm that focuses on environmentally friendly interiors and unique home furnishings. Now, I'm not trying to age any of you guys, but I did the math and together you represent, I think over a hundred years of experience, perhaps more. Uh, so I want to thank you all so much for being here. Anyone listening, you guys are written for a real treat. Um, to kick off our conversation, you know, construction waste, it's, it's kind of like a nebulous concept. Um, why don't we start with defining it and telling us why contractors, contractors, excuse me, should even care about construction waste? So in my business, I only do kitchen and bath design and renovation, and I'm not doing any new construction. I'm doing renovating of older homes, typically 1920s. My biggest concern has been construction debris from demolition. And so much goes into that dumpster that it's either not really usable or it really is trash because most of my clients are coming to me because their kitchen's falling apart. So we're not reusing the cabinets, but they have to go somewhere. And so when you think of the big problem of that, is it an environmental concern? Is it a cost concern, a wasted, like just simply a waste of product? Like, or is it all that stuff? Well, it's a waste of resources. So all those raw materials and all the energy that it took to create it and transport it. But then the physical bulk that it takes and it, it goes to a landfill. So in my area, we um, household trash is burned in an incinerator. New Jersey does not have landfills anymore. They're all full and they transfer to incinerators, but okay. bulky waste and construction waste is trucked to a transfer station and then taken by train out of state. Well, what's amazing is you have this like big infrastructure for transporting waste, but there seems to be zero infrastructure for handling the reclamation of potentially reusable materials. I mean, especially in historic homes. And Stephen, maybe you can talk to this too, because you work on a lot of historic homes. I mean, there are materials, old growth, redwood or forest, first growth, uh, yellow pine, stuff like that, really nice wood that can be reused. That's just going in the dump and it's never coming back. Construction waste by volume is twice the amount of municipal solid waste. So when you think of like just your trash that you know you put out on the curb once a week or whatever, construction waste is takes up uh, is twice the volume of that. Just to put that into perspective. So, is it a huge problem? Yeah, it's a big problem. Uh, I think uh, you know there is of course the environmental impact of all this stuff going, uh, and you know as much as uh, some municipalities try to sort it you know electronic waste and all that you know there's just uh you know there's you really can't do much about it that these do have a, a large environmental impact then there's other uh ways of looking at it that um that you know wood when uh it deteriorates in a landfill creates more negative greenhouse gases than if you would chip it on your property so uh the way we dispose of things uh has environmental impact but just 
to establish the problem, construction waste is twice the volume of municipal solid waste. And I mean that, so, so are we a part of the problem? Yeah, we're a part of the problem. And construction waste accounts for a third of all global waste. Also of that solid waste, 40% of that is wood. And the wood is coming off of, you know, cutoffs from construction sites, uh, not well planned homes. So that, you know, there's a lot of uh, leftover plywood, two by fours that, you know, most people are throwing in dumpsters and that those dumpsters are just creating more and more landfill. And another statistic is that of this weight construction waste, 90% of it comes from the demo phase. So that's what uh, James was referring to and Trace was referring to. So, you know, we in our practice have ways of uh, deconstructing buildings and saving some of that. And if you can save 10, 15, 20% of that from going to the dump, you are making a significant impact. So we can talk about that later, but that's amazing. 90% is from demo, you know, alone. The ideal situation for us is, you know, you eliminate construction waste or you develop some sort of program to handle construction waste in such a way that one is it's, it's not environmentally detrimental and uh, two that you could potentially uh, reuse it. But, you know, that's not happening. So before we get into, you know, what real world things contractors can do, let's talk about what are the big barriers here? You know, why has this become a problem in the first place? What, what's going on here? I think that for the most part, most contractors aren't like Stephen. They're not well educated when it comes to waste. And I think that uh, they're not that careful um, when it comes down to it. It's fine. Just throw it in the dumpster when you're not, you know, when you got stuff that you're not using, just throw it in there and put it in the landfill. I also think that, you know, when it comes to designing new products, new homes, new buildings, if if the designers actually design to nominal sizes, they might uh, have a lot less waste. If you were to design a home uh, and use a nine foot two by four without for a vertical wall, and you made the ceiling nine feet, more or less, you wouldn't have to cut it. If you design the floor plan so that it uses four by eight sheets of plywood instead of, you know, fractions of that, you wouldn't yeah. have leftover pieces of the plywood. Well, so, I, you know, I'm not a designer and architect by any stretch of the imagination. I'm more of an observer. So when I think of like changing the dimensions of something, that sounds really easy. But, you know, is there a reason that people aren't already doing that? Is it just like a non-standardized kind of approach to, to layouts and home building? Or is it just a matter of people have been doing it and that's the way it's been happening? I think it's a lot easier if you're doing new construction. You have more control over it. So in my projects I'm doing within an existing footprint. And I'm limited by what that space is. But one of the like a tiny little detail it so i do a lot of tile and with in stock tile it's not such a big deal to order a little more if you run short but with custom tile where it might be like a six to ten week lead time i always have to order extra because i don't want the job to shut down if we run short so usually though i end up with several extra boxes of tile so i try to reuse it on the next project or whatever. Uh, well, that's tile. That's that's an interesting part, too, because, you know, ceramic tile, at least the industry of ceramic tile industry, they will boast very much that their uh, ceramic tiles can be recycled. So I'd imagine the difficulty there is getting dem demo tile to that manufacturer so they can recycle them. Keeping that in mind with, you know, manufacturer programs that may help people recycle, are there things that you guys have identified in that way, um, not getting too much in it, but are there routes to, you know, work with manufacturers to help get materials recycled off job sites? Or is that something that's like wholly on the contractor so far as you guys know? I'm remembering something that I saw at KBiz 
mm. maybe last time last year that Kohler introduced a tile collection that was entirely recycled from their own tile or tile that people had brought in or scraps from manufacturing i think more and more companies are providing recycled content material do you I mean, do a lot of reclamation do you keep all of the material you reclaim or do you know of like are are, are there ways for you to ship it out uh right now you know we just use everything that we uh you know deconstruct i mean let's face it the problem is we're a disposable society and that's the way in this capitalist society we're set up there's you know less incentive to reuse so the two arguments i make uh are you know cost and client one is that you know i argue with people i don't really care whether you think there's you know global warming or not you know the client more clients out there are looking for people who are environmentally conscious so even if you don't agree with with that what you need to do is you need to look at that growing client base so then if you're not presenting yourself as an authentically you know sustainable uh, approach to construction you're losing out on a potential client because you'll get a job and then somebody will say oh i have this great you know, designer, we have this great architect, we have this great uh, you know, construction firm, whatever you, you are, uh, and they're so fantastic and they do this, you know, they're, they're, they, you know, recycle, they really think it through. And then, and then that's going to appeal to a certain client base. So you're losing out on marketing if you're not, if you're not thinking about this. So one is just, I don't care what you think, so true. think about it as a marketing aspect. The other is that if you, you know, for us, when we, um, do something and we take a, a building apart to make a new building we you know reuse all that framing on site we use many parts so that's a cost issue so when you think about it you know i you know we've proven that we're saving money so um you know there is the social side of it that i'm reducing landfill and all that but unfortunately the way our system works that's not quantified you know those costs are societal costs and not quantified into our job costs but yeah. so therefore i think you know look at it just as a marketing thing of like hey i'm going to be cooler and sexier than the other person because these are my values and i'm putting them out there well it sounds too like w one of the issue i mean because it seems like a no-brainer right you know like you, you have a push from your client base for it or at least a client base for it um and it's helpful both to you as a company because you're getting to reuse the materials you're losing like you're, you're you're like wiping those costs out and you're helping the environment it sounds to me like one of the major problems is maybe education. Um, when you guys interact with with colleagues and peers, um, and Tracy and Wayne, maybe you guys can speak to this as well. Are you finding that when you kind of tiptoe into these conversations that you're being met with, I mean, ignorance is kind of like has a negative connotation to it, but are you being met with people who don't really grasp the situation or, or understand maybe not how easy it would be to help and how impactful it might be? So, in in my experience, I found that um, it's it's a heavy lift for a lot of potential clients. Um, it's not that they don't want to hear it, uh, but they want to know what is a cost. Um, and from Stephen's perspective, if he reuses stuff, then maybe he reduces the cost. But if I'm going to try to introduce things like, you know, reclaiming uh, waste, or if it's a new build. Uh, I'm asking the contractor to do X, Y, and Z. They, you know, often the contractors, at least out here, aren't that savvy when it comes to that. And there really aren't a lot of avenues for things. There are avenues for things like, you know, appliances that you remove from uh, houses or, you know, windows or, you know, things like that. But, you know, I think that, that, you know, Stephen's right, there's a growing base of people that are responsive to this. And I think that that's really the way it's going to e evolve, is that more and more people, more and more, like your, your podcast here, more and more places where people hear about it and understand the impact of it is going to move it forward. But I don't see it moving forward very quickly. Um, I've created this niche for myself in my area as a sustainable Echo Smart kitchen and bath. And so people are coming to me for that because that's what they want. And the two things they're most excited about is 
that I'm going to specify for them healthy, safe materials. I'm not going to bring anything in their house that's toxic or poisonous or off-gassing or that kind of stuff. And so that's a big uh, benefit. And also, um, for construction debris, I specify all my contractors to use a dumpster company that recycles the debris. So um, about 98% of it is recycled, and you can get lead points for it. And um, so the wood lumber is shredded for fuel, and the porcelain and masonry and countertops are crushed for road paving. And so clients are very excited that their trash is not going to go to a landfill. That's something like you've actively like you kind of market that and your your clients respond. Is it is it as little as, oh, that's pretty cool, or is it as much as we are going to work with you because of this? Uh, I uh, accept uh, fewer jobs than I'm offered. So I'm good position that point in my career where I'm lucky enough that I can kind of pick and choose but I think it is definitely a selling point and uh people are very excited about it and I recently did a project for clients who are chemically sensitive so it, it was more than sustainability it was like a deep dive into you know chemistry yeah <laughs> and um we were able to do it. I learned a lot on that. Also, and you know, when you're thinking about talking with peers, colleagues, and, and clients to a certain extent, you know, it's always been a bit of a stereotype for our industry that there is a, a certain kind of mindset and attitude, uh, and that is traditionally inclined against sustainability. And in, in, I don't want to call it liberal thinking, but progressive, whatever you want to call it. Um, do you find that there is a prevailing attitude that creates sort of resistance to this kind of change? I think early on, I found resistance from contractors who didn't want to try new materials because they were worried about callbacks down the line. They didn't want to use something they haven't tested themselves or have been using for you know years and years. So. Prime example was replacing fiberglass insulation with formaldehyde. <laughs> it's like, why wouldn't you want to get rid of that? Yes. Um, and so first there was the recycled denim, and now we're using the mineral wool um, insulation. And once the contractors started using it, they say, oh, this is great. We're going to do this on all our jobs now. But it was a little sort of concern about having to be responsible for something they didn't really know. Yeah, I think uh, the board on materials, probably. Yeah, I, Tracy, I really couldn't agree with you more. I mean, this isn't always necessarily about construction waste, but just about bringing sustainability into the job. Right. The number one problem we have in the residential sector is that most subcontractors are small mom and pop operations. So why would they take on a new uh, product? Because they're going to get callback and warranty issues on the first five of those, and that's going to reduce their profit already you know the the that subsector in residential so uh cost sensitive like how do i pick you know an hvc contractor no client's going to know they're just going to pick on price so if you're driving down the price of your product and you have callbacks you're out of business so there's an incredible resistance to uh new products i mean i've had that with heat pump hot water heaters and, and, mm -hmm. and we put them in, you know, ourselves, and yeah, I got a few callbacks on them in the beginning. I had to learn about it, and that is a problem in the industry, is a resistance to new ways of doing things. Definitely. Yeah. We just installed a heat pump. So excited! We love it. <laughs> well, that kind of moves us into. I mean, we've been touching on it a bit and sort of skirting around it. Is you know what can contractors realistically do? Um, when you think about new materials and Stephen, particularly for you, because I know you've used a lot of, you know, like composite paper countertops and uh, I think like mushroom based uh, wall paneling or something along those lines. You, you're someone who's very, uh, you know, exploratory when it comes to using potentially more sustainable, more eco, eco friendly materials. How do you go about finding those kind of materials 
as I mean, because of course those are an avenue to ultimately reducing construction waste. But how, how do you go about finding those new materials? Yeah, um, surprisingly, some of them are just old approaches. You know, historically, before you know we had all this industrialization, there were some very good eco approaches, like, like, cross, like cross ventilation. What's that? <laughs> Like, like linoleum, linoleum, for example, <laughs> yeah. I use that a lot. Yeah, floors. cross ventilation or anything. So, yeah. um, you know, I mean, the way we're the, specifically, so there's a lot of products out there. Some of those products out there, agricultural waste products, you know, chipboard and things like that, are more expensive. So, you know, those are difficult uh, burdens. So, um, some things like we do our own uh, plaster. We have our own plaster um, group in house and. Uh, one of the things one day we have an environmental analyst too, and he was having a conversation with our, the head of our plaster department and, and the head of our plaster department was talking about how his grandfather who taught him how to plaster with old um, leather shoe bob, you know, shoe soles. Uh, he was talking about how his grandfather used to add uh, chopped up uh, straw into the plaster uh, because, you know, and, 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 and so the environmental analyst, Charlie, he was said, Oh, well, you know, that's a, that's carbon sequestration. And because what you're doing is you're replacing industrial made material with agricultural waste. So you're, you're spreading that, that impact of that industrial product farther. And so we make, we make these beautiful hand applied plaster with no paint and it looks like grass cloth and it's absolutely beautiful. The cost is actually pencils out. Okay. Because you're not painting. So the paint cost that you're saving goes into the cost of the hand applied plaster. So, you know, there are ways when you think about it, you know, uh, the, the creativity is you have to bring that, the trade together with the designer and really think through those those options, um, you yeah. know, and have, have the trade people who are willing to, uh, you know, think creatively. But, you know, as far as construction waste goes, you know, really thinking through what can I salvage, it, it's an education, you know, you have to stop, look at this pile, and say, what can I reuse? Oh, I'm breaking up a driveway. Well, that would make a really great urbanite planter. You know, you just have to uh, catch yourself because the demo process moves so quickly. Well, that's something you you brought up briefly, Wayne, earlier was cut-ins uh, or in, in sort of waste generated in a new construction project because uh, you're not planning your materials, right? Um, you know, what what are some of the things that you're finding are really effective ways to collect and reuse some of that material? And also, how are you identifying it? So, you know, I think it, it all comes down to my personal experience being my own construction manager and building my passive house. And um, in that experience, I didn't do very much in terms of saving, you know, material, but I noticed how much was going into the dumpster and so I pulled a lot of stuff out. It's still sitting in my basement. Um, but, you know, I have a shop, so I use a lot of the cutoffs and I use a lot of the scrap wood and I make things out of it and it's great. And so what I started thinking about was that, uh, what if there was, a, then we're talking about a small area out on Eastern Long Island and there is, you know, probably about two dozen contractors and they all are doing their thing. And, you know, I started thinking about creating a kind of Facebook group for these guys because they all have stuff on their job sites that is amazing amount of good stuff. Yeah. So if they could all sort of, you know, list that stuff on a, a website. And now there's something on Facebook called Buy Nothing. So there's these Buy Nothing groups all over the country now where people are just giving away stuff. And I'm thinking that why can't we just do that for construction material that's just sitting on job sites waiting to go into a dumpster? And um, and so, I mean, to be totally honest, I haven't done that much, but you know, I've looked into these things and sort of, you know, um, kind of discussed it with a number of contractors out there and they're kind of look at me a little, you know, cross-eyed um, when I say this stuff because they don't want one more thing to do, right? Yeah. They're trying to make a living, and but I think eventually it'll it'll get there. Yeah, the um, you know, of course, if we can have this 
from a code and a policy point of view, that would be the best thing. As uh, we have, as a group discussed before, I mentioned, you know, in Oregon, uh, any building that was built before 1940 has to be deconstructed because, uh, you know, we all understand that those homes were, or those structures were built with old growth Douglas fir, old growth redwood. So the material is very valuable. You don't want to throw it out. Right. Um, so unfortunately, you know, the code would be a great way to address this. And until that happens, it just falls upon us designers and builders to try to be creative. But I think that creativity is a selling point, you know, just as mm -hmm. sustainability right. is a selling point. I mean, we take our cutoffs and, uh, you know, we, we have a whole bunch of two by three cutoffs because you can't use two by threes as much anymore. And these old growth two by threes, we turned them into parquet floors with inset tile. You know, I always think of the, uh, you know, the Apollo mission that, you know, they had that explosion and there they were in the middle of space and they were just had only the things that they had in their capsule to get them back to earth. And I think that creativity that they, you know, they showed yeah. is the creativity we have to approach with that pile of, of rubble that we're given it, a, a demo, is look at that stuff and think of creative, beautiful ways to, to reuse it, you know, from a parquet floor to we take cutoffs of our uh, wood and we make cabinets out of them, you know, but there are ways of doing it. Besides, you know, changing codes and whatever, I mean, there could be things like, you know, financial incentives that can help and encourage people to do things. I mean, it all comes down to lobbying. It all comes down to active, you know, uh, participation, you know, activism to try to get this stuff done. But yeah. it's, it's, you know, happens slowly. And maybe just like food trends, it goes from west to east. So Yeah, well, the code, you know, the code takes a while to change. But back to the argument is clients are looking for furniture that is made responsibly, whether mm -hmm. it be reclaimed or FSC. Clients are looking for people who are being responsible towards the environment. And I think yeah. that's the thing I would tell everybody is just don't think of what you think. Think of what your potential clients want. There's um, the Free Cycle Network, which is a national network for posting things for free. And on my job sites, first we offer anything the clients don't want to the workers on the site. And if they don't want it, then I post it on Free Cycle. And typically it's appliances or sinks. If it's an old toilet with a high gallon flush, I put that in the dumpster for recycling. Um, I will no longer put gas stoves back into circulation. I only install induction cooking in my projects. But um, so that's one source and also Habitat for Humanity. Sometimes if the cabinets are in good shape, they will post them, sell them. The seller gets a tax credit. Habitat sells it and gets money. So there's a way to connect all that. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that I just learned last week that New York State Legislature is considering a bill, and I'm just going to look at my notes, that would require contractors in cities of 1 million plus population to use or recycle 50% of construction and demolition debris. Yeah, we in California, we have that in most of our municipalities. So. Uh-huh. That is uh, you already that, have it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And would you say um it is something that is like diligently followed and policed? I wouldn't say it's diligently followed, you know, but it's uh you know, it's it's better than nothing. So it's uh you know, that's yeah, it, it's hard to be perfect. That's why else the argument I make is you know, when we're approaching sustainability or anything like that, we can't be perfect because there's only you know two lead perfect homes and you know yeah. you know there's so few but if people can get 50 percent of their way there 60 percent 70 percent that's that's amazing if it's a law then that means more of the uh, waste management companies are going to offer recycling services well, for, they're required yeah for construction because otherwise yeah. it's just a dumpster going to a landfill and it really is a good selling point for clients mm -hmm. well, in terms of actually reclaiming product, I mean, we've talked about New York a little and, and California, the East Coast. I mean, these are two historic areas where you have like a lot of old building materials. When we think of middle America or the South where, you know, building has been like quick and a bit haphazard maybe, 
if you were to talk about, you know, carefully demoing those homes, are they being used in material? Is the average home basically being used with materials where if you did demolish it like carefully, is that material still worth using or is it a waste of your time? There's a percentage of it that is. I think actually this idea of uh, reuse would be a wonderful thing for FEMA to look into when there's a hurricane that whips through. We all have seen those piles of trash that, you know, our uh, homes have been hit by a tornado. But can you imagine if the local building inspectors were deputized to allow people to pull lumber out and take the nails out and reuse it, which you know they could, well, that'll get the community back on their feet. They're more resilient because they'll have, instead of waiting for, you know, wood to be shipped there because now suddenly there's a high demand for it. Well, we have, you know, some of these building materials here and we've cut 10, 15, you know, 30% out of out of our needs, uh, you know, by just resourcing within the community. So I, I think um, there's always material that can be uh, reused, yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. Right, but I mean, the best thing about old buildings is to try to reuse them as opposed to demolish them, right? I mean, the adaptive reuse movement, you certainly see it in historic areas where people are required to figure out ways to adapt and reuse homes. But of course, it's also a cost thing. I mean, in my area here, uh, Los Angeles, you know, houses are so expensive. People are not going to be, you know, and there's shacks out here. And I'm like, well, you got to be kidding me, the price for that. They're, people are not going to be tearing that down. They're going to be adapting right. it. And so, you know, the greenest person around is the person who takes an existing structure and insulates it. You know, because then they've reduced their embodied carbon footprint, the carbon cost of building something, and they've, you know, they've reduced their operational by insulating. So, you know, uh, people do are forced to because of, you know, values, but also um, and other reasons. But adaptive reuse is a is a wonderful approach. Yeah, we found actually uh, in a number of projects where people purchased, you know, homes built in the '80s, so they're not historic. Right, they're not something you'd really want to save, but they don't want to take it down. <clears throat> and so, you know, we're passive house architects, so we do energy retrofits to create a much better envelope, so that they could actually be there, use less fossil fuels in heating and cooling, change the gas appliances to induction, and um, you know, it's a way of reusing something that's existing and all the embodied carbon is still in there and you're not knocking it down you're not you're not trying to figure out where the waste goes that's an easiest way to be sustainable in a way right yeah even, even though the house is not what i would call beautiful uh at first so yeah adaptive reuse is is you know a very valid approach but you know, if it's a small house and, you know, it really needs density increases, demand a bigger house with an ADU, just making sure you reuse more on site and reduce your, uh, you know, your um, waste is, uh, you know, very uh, you know easy to do. You just have to change your mindset. Right. Yeah. I imagine one of the big issues is a lot of production builders, I assume they would generate a lot of waste. Uh, have you have any of you had conversations with production builders about the idea of sustainability? Because I can't imagine them wrapping their head around, you know, like a 300 home community dealing with that waste. Or maybe like they have something else that I don't know about. But that seems like probably one of the big waste producers there. It, uh, it, it seems to me, though, that, you know, I haven't dealt with those uh, developer builders, but modular might be the answer to those kinds of communities where you can design the thing to be built in a factory, have very little waste and be brought to the site. And perhaps that's an answer. Have any of you, and, and Tracy, you mostly stick with remodels. Have you dealt with any panelization, prefab, modular, anything like that? Not at all. Steven, have you worked in that? I like space? the idea. <laughs> yeah, I like the idea too. I mean, it's not as popular as you think it might be. Right. I mean, certainly from a, a waste point of view, anytime you're dealing with a uh, production facility, you're going to be reducing your waste. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and production home builders do reduce their waste because they order materials so specifically. But we don't do as much uh, of that modular because uh, it just reduces the possibilities that people want for a custom home. 
a little sidebar to that. Um, so I like to build within the existing footprint. And I find that a lot of, um, well, sometimes I'll go meet with someone and they've met with someone before who insists that the only way they could get a better kitchen is to have this big bump out addition in their backyard. And then I start talking with them and there's so much space surrounding the kitchen space that's not being used or is poorly planned. And so I've been able in my 30 year career, every time to get a good kitchen without an addition. Although I'm just starting a project next month where they clearly need more space. <laughs> but uh -huh. I, it's just, you know, being smart with the planning that um and well, where would where would you say that a lot of contractors that you see go wrong with the planning and and what's the fix there Do you I use the existing space and i might take down the wall into the dining room because they don't ever use their dining room and they have a more informal lifestyle and it just doesn't work for them to have this room they never use so you know we open it all up but it a lot of it is about just kitchen planning and organization and storage and just making sure there's a place for everything mm -hmm. you don't need a huge kitchen to do that it's just being mindful about what you're going to do with all their stuff so it's a lot of talking and interviewing and finding out how they live their daily life uh when we think about you know planning for your materials and this is something we've kind of touched on a couple times are there any methods that you guys have adopted to make it a little bit more precise so that you end up with less waste uh, well, you know, we're reducing our uh, waste to, you know, reducing the demo, the waste in the demo. But, you know, I have a uh, problem is I, you know, Tracy brought up a point is that when you're doing custom homes, you know, you have to order more of tile and things like that, because, you know, if you go back for the next batch, the colorway is not going to match, you know, or you're going to hold up the job. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you are, you know, there, there is just a, a little bit of waste factor you have to, uh, but, you know, uh, you pick and choose your battles. So, you know, if you're uh, reducing it on demo, but you have to do it on tile, you know, um, I think that's legitimate. Actually, you know, some of our work are projects that are, you know, large interiors within New York City. So we have one now where I told the contractors to save all of the handles, all the door handles, and reuse the, you know, metal grills. And there was a sauna in there, reuse the heater i mean that's just I, I didn't just come upon this i've been a dumpster diver since i was little um and so for me it's you know it's just a shame to throw that kind of stuff away this in particular this apartment was a very high-end apartment to begin with so things like door handles and things like that are beautiful and if, if they don't reuse it then i'm going to put it in my basement I mean, the argument there, if somebody's listening to this, would be, you know, that sensitivity, uh, you know, um, is a selling point. Again, it's, you know, that you put that on your website is, you know, oh, wow, this person's, you know, creative and sensitive and, and you know, creative beauty. For high-end luxury kitchens that are being taken out, there's a company called Renovation Angel. They okay. started out maybe like... 20 years ago they were called green demolitions but they will come in and um uninstall the cabinets appliances to countertops everything and then they resell them and they're um, uh, and then they donate to a charity wow so they're all in really good shape and they're um they're very picky about what they'll accept mm -hmm. anything that they want <laughs> that's a good resource thanks to sort of wrap us up um i'm hoping we can just go around the horn and i'm thinking tracy we'll start with you and then go to wayne and we'll just end with steven um if you you know imagine a contractor or someone in the industry is listening to this um and, and you know hearing this conversation what's the top thing you want them to go away learning if they're going to learn anything at all I think a good place to start in getting into sustainability, which is the wave of the future, and all our clients are going to want it, is to find someone to partner with who's already focused on sustainability, 
who you can learn from and partner with on projects? I think for me, it would be that, um, you know, either together learning more about how to reduce the, you know, solid waste stream from these projects. But, you know, I think it just takes teamwork too. Uh, it's not just, I can dictate this. It's very hard to put it into a construction document. You know, it, it needs to be that. And then it also needs to be the client. I mean, like, you know, usual, it's a three part system, right? You need the client to buy into it. And uh, Stephen, I don't always find those clients <laughs> in my practice. They're not always that uh, amenable to this. And uh, and then contractors who are basically sympathetic to this, to work together, to kind of create a project that really is a, you know, a star project that can be kind of brought out in front of a lot of different people to say, here's how one way you can do it. That's what I would hope. Yeah. yeah. I guess we should not be surprised that the uh, founder of the Turret Collaborative loves collaboration. Sort of <laughs> very on brand. Right. So again, it's back about marketing your services. I mean, it's not about what you think. It's about going into a meeting with your client, whether you're a designer, an architect, or a contractor, and being the smartest person in the room. I don't care if you think about you know global warming as a problem. But if you're going into a you know kitchen remodel and you don't know about induction cooktops, you don't know why they're better uh, for in indoor help. How you know 90% of the energy goes into the cooking vessel, whereas gas 70% goes into the atmosphere and you know it's pollution and heat. You know, and if you're a contractor, if you don't know and aren't able to advise it, oh well, you know actually there are some induction cooktops which are lower amperage, and you, we could fit that into your existing panel. So I don't care you shouldn't care about what you think politically what you should care about is your client base and the client base is growing in sustainability people are looking for that and even i have found if they're not looking for that the fact that we come in and we talk about these possibilities oh they know more than anybody else so they're not just offering me gas or convection and you know they oh they know all these possibilities aren't they the smartest people around so i think you just have to think you know that's just think that you want to be the smartest person in that conversation. And that's, it's about growing your business.